Welcome to Hacks for Shed. It's a bit chilly today, not degrees outside, that's 32 for some people. In this video, we're going to look at measuring between centres and then do some turning between centres. And this is the fourth in a series of videos looking at the alignment and accuracy of this lathe. So if you've just landed here now and not seen the other videos, I'll just say to you that video 40 was about the accuracy of the tailstock itself and the taper in this tailstock in particular. Uh, video 48 was looking at deviation if we put a long bar in here and flexed it up and down, how much movement could we get when it was not supported at the tailstock end. And video 52 looked at the wear on the bed. So in this video we can do some measurements but with the knowledge of what's happening with the various parts of the leg here, here and the bed. And then we can understand if we have a problem whether that's because let's say the tailstock is out of alignment or whether the problem is actually bed wear. But the final test will be when we turn, do some turning between centres and see if our bar is parallel. So I'm going to do some static tests with this bar and I'm going to do some turning tests with this which you might immediately recognise as a front drive shaft from a Volkswagen Passat if I can get it into the lathe between the centres. Let's just have a look at what we know. In an ideal world, headstock, tailstock, bed, everything's in line. But as you know, I suspect that my taper in the tailstock is a little bit offline. This is what I think is happening here. So you can see it's just a bit offline. This is exaggerated, obviously. And I thought that because when I put in a long drill or a long reamer, it seemed to be way off centre. Now, without looking at all aspects of the lathe, I could easily have simply adjusted this tailstock to bring this centre into line with the centre line of the lathe. But in doing so, it might solve a problem with taper turning, for example, but it's not going to fix the problem when I put a long reamer into the lathe. Let's just move that up slightly. And so I wouldn't be fixing the root cause. Okay, I could turn between centres, but I wouldn't be fixing the root cause. Okay, I'd still have this problem. Now, I think everybody watching would know that, but, I, but it's worth just setting it out so we're all on the same page, I think. The other thing I want to say before we start, from our bed wear investigation, if you can follow this diagram, here's the bed, the V-ways, the flat ways. We know we've got wear on the flat way near the chuck, and we know we've got wear on this side of the V-way as we get near the chuck. And the wear here was about three one hundredths of a millimetre. So that's about 1.2 thou. And the wear here was about one and a half one hundredths of a millimetre. So about 0.6 thou. So how much effect is this going to have? Well, let's say we're not cutting anything for the minute. We're simply at rest. If I look at the relative dimensions between the center line of this flat way and the pivot point, which is really around the top of that V-way. I know the top of the V-way doesn't touch, but it's going to pivot around that point. And I look at the height of the tool, it's about the same as this distance. So we've got ourselves a kind of triangle where these two sides are about the same length. And approximately speaking, if this comes down by 1.2 thou, the tool would move towards the work by 1.2 thou. Just an approximation, not exact, because obviously things move around when you're working. But we wouldn't have this wear further along the bed towards his tailstock. Now, when we're cutting, it's a dynamic situation and everything's different because the force between the tool and the work is going to push the whole saddle this way and then this wear here is going to come into effect 
And if this keep isn't tight, this side of the saddle is going to lift up. And both of those things are going to move the tool away from the work. So again, these are things we might just want to keep in mind as we're doing our measurements on a static bar and when the tool's under heavy load and cutting. Okay, so to begin with, I need to look at that taper in the tailstock and I need to clean it up. I know there's some rust inside of it. I know it's a bit damaged. So what I've done is I bought some Mars Taper 3 reamers just to clean it up a bit. And I'll put a bit of video in here which describes them and the day they arrived and uh, why I chose the particular ones that I did. So I looked on eBay for a Morse Taper 3 reamer and there were some available second-hand Presto 20 pounds plus delivery and I may only use this reamer once so I didn't want to pay too much and I found these £14.95 delivered and I thought I'd give them a try. So I'll use this one to very carefully clean up the inside of the taper and repeat my tailstock alignment checks. So there is my Moss Taper 3 reamer and we'll just use that on the tailstock now. I'm not going to try and cut anything, I just want to clean it up a little bit and make sure it's as true as I can get it. I do have a fan heater in here, but if I turned it on when I was videoing, you wouldn't hear me very well. I took some still shots of the inside of this taper and I'll put them in now. It was not too bad at the very front here, but it was quite rusty at the back. So. I'm just going to give it just a little bit of a scrape, that's all. Take off any high spots there might be, that's all. That'll do. And I can see just some shavings there. Okay, with the tailstock back on, I can put the centres in. And then we can put the test bar between the centers. This is a very nice test bar. I bought it from India through eBay for about 30 pounds. So I've just put that lightly between centers and I've got the Morse taper end here near the headstock. And if I then put on my dial test indicator, we can start to make some measurements. I'm going to start at this end, let's just check that the bar is round. Well, you'd expect it, wouldn't you? I've had to bring the nose of this tailstock out quite a way because I want to be able to move the saddle as far back as I reasonably can. So having this out this far might introduce error, but there's no way around it. So as I bring it towards the headstock, you'll see that it starts to move off and it moves off a maximum of probably four one hundredths of a millimetre and as I get a bit further on it settles at about three one hundredths of a millimetre of deviation. Now that could be because the tailstock is out of line slightly but I think it's more or as likely to be the wear which we saw on the flat way on the far side of the, of the saddle over there. Uh, and that was about three one hundredths of a millimeter. So the two things could be in play. I can't say for sure, but it looks that way. Because I've always thought that this tailstock is in line. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to adjust the position of this dial gauge because I want to be able to run the saddle onto the bed gap block because I know that runs off and we saw that earlier when we did the bed measurements. Now I've moved the DTI to the back side of this multi-fix and the saddle doesn't travel as far along the bed now so we're on a worn part of the bed where the back flatway is, we know that's worn, it's dished down by 1.2 thou we think 
But what it means is that as I bring this forward, the front leading edge of the saddle will go onto the gap block. And we know the gap block runs out of it. So I hope you'll be able to see this. We start at zero, we move on a bit, and we see the effect of the wear on the back flat way where the saddle rests away from the other side of us. It comes back into line, uh, but now the front edge of the saddle starts to get onto the bed gap block and then it runs out again. And it runs out by, well, that's about 0.8 of a thou. Now I had the block out and in again recently and it may be that I've got it settled in a slightly better place. But when I'm turning between centres, I find that it comes offline by a couple of thou perhaps, so adding four thou to the diameter. So that's what we see when we're doing a static test. And now I want to move on to actually cutting some metal and see what the effect is there. Now that drive shaft is going to be pretty tough and it's also a little bit longer than I want it to be. But we'll see if we can get it in and we'll see how it cuts. And then we can do some measurements on that. We're a couple of days further on. Everything we've done up to now has been great as background information, as an intellectual exercise, but what really counts is how it turns metal. So I've got my bar, I've got a driving plate, and I've got my dog. So let's get it set up now. I'm a bit tight for space, so I'm going to use this short MT2 live centre with this MT3 adapter and I'm going to have to check it to make sure that it runs true. Well that's not great, it's out by about a thou. Mm, not good. Let's get this end set up and see what that's like. I've swapped over centres because this one is a bit shorter than this one and it gives me a little bit more available bed length and now I'm checking to make sure this is running true. I'll do the old spin check. Well that's out by half a thou. <laughs> it just goes to show how hard you have to work if you try to set up for absolute accuracy. You can't just slap these things together and assume they're okay. I've given up on the idea of a live centre, so I've put in this half centre. I don't, it doesn't need to be a half centre, it's just that it's got a welded in insert tip, a hardened tip. I'll still have to be careful I don't fry it though. So let's get this dog on. So, driving slots, two, driving peg, balance weight, bent leg dog. So you can get bent leg dogs and straight leg dogs. Um, people have different ideas about what's best. The only thing I'd say about a bent leg dog is that it's important to make sure the leg here clears the bottom of this slot. Because if it hangs up on the bottom of this slot it can give the appearance that the centre is incorrectly and that it's running freely, but actually it's not quite on the centre. And I had this once. And in fact, when I was using one side of this plate, one of these driving slots, it was fine, but using the other, it wasn't identical. The leg was really quite close to the bottom of this driving slot. And uh, when I set it up one way randomly, it wasn't sitting properly on the centre. So, just need to be a bit careful. It's all set up now and ready to test. Let's check this German engineering. Well, that's out of 
concentric by about 0.4 of a millimeter, so about 16 thou. So I'll need to take about 20 thou off the diameter of the bar to get it concentric. I was a bit worried it would chatter, but I'm getting a wonderful finish on that. It's lovely. Can you see it shine? Carry on. I'll go right along with this as a rough cut, then I'll come back and do a finish cut. First pass done. That was 480 RPM, 0.062 millimetres per rev, which is about two and a half thou per rev. Fantastic finish. Don't know if you can get the reflection from that. The centre at this end got hot, but didn't burn. Now I've got to go to the dentist. So I'll have to wait till I get back. Right then, back from the dentist. Did a temporary patch, charged me 23 quid, said come back in two weeks, we'll take that off and do it properly next time and I'll charge you some more. So, result there. Okay, so I'm going to take about a quarter of a mil off this, 10 thou, just to give the uh, carbide something to chew on to do a finished cut. And I've moved the carbide round to use a fresh tip. So this will be it and then we'll measure it and just see what we got then. Somebody did say they wanted to see a bit more machining, so there's a bit more machining. Very nice. I think it's all one piece from start to finish. It's like a pan scrubber. I've just thought of one thing where a bent leg dog is different from a straight leg dog. With a bent leg dog, it's captured. It ain't gonna clack more than that. But if it's a straight leg dog, it could start off at this side and whack its way right round to the other side. Say you were spinning really quickly, then you stopped quickly. It could smack almost 360 degrees round. Here's a big straight leg dog. Couldn't resist it. No idea if I'll ever use it. So here's the summary, 28.44 millimetres at this right hand side, 28.39 at the left hand side, measuring after 100, 200, and then some intermediates in the middle at 150 or six inches, and then a couple of inches in here, 50 millimetres. And then if you can focus on that line where I've just put that bar, those are the differences from this end in millimetres, here. So you can see how it barrels out a little bit in the middle, but by the time you're getting to this end, you're under this dimension. And then I've also, if you can keep your eye on that line that I've just masked out, that's in thou, okay? So the difference between the right hand side and the left hand side is minus two thou when you get to the left hand side there. But when you're only two inches uh, away from that towards this side, you're almost exact, look. The difference is only a hundredth of a millimeter or point four of a thou relative to this point here. So my conclusion to all of this is the tail stop doesn't need adjusting. Now, I should say, 
I didn't lock the top slide, but I did take up the backlash. So I'm fairly sure that wouldn't have much effect. It would have been better if I'd locked it. And so, in my view, all this is really down to bed wear. I've set the dial test indicator up at exactly the point where the tool would have touched the work, which should mean that the saddle is in exactly the same place. So as I wind the saddle along this way, we should see that needle stay on zero because that is how it was set up when it was cut. Let's try it. Well, it's still staying pretty close to zero there. Ah, but now look, it's going off. And that's showing about six one hundredths of a millimetre, which is about 2.4 thou. Well, what's the difference? Why is that happening? I think it can only be the difference between a lathe static and a lathe running. There's no force here against this work. This saddle is not being pushed towards me, but it would be if the lathe was cutting. I think perhaps the only way to get round this is to have the bed reground, but I don't need to do that. I'll just work with it as it is. If you can see any mistake that I'm making, if I've missed an adjustment somewhere, do please leave a comment. One thing I haven't mentioned in all of this is the alignment of the headstock. And that's because you can't adjust it on this lathe. This V-way here runs right underneath this headstock and the whole gearbox and head sit on it. So it's set at the time of manufacture. And, you know, let's hope they got it right, but I think they probably did. You can probably just make out the V here, where this V-way continues right under the headstock. Well, that's about as far as I can take this topic of uh, lathe accuracy. After four videos, finally, it's probably the end. Um, I really enjoyed it. You know what they say, it'll be all right in the end. And if it's not all right, it's not the end. I got so confused by the results that I found that I stripped the whole thing down, took everything out, cleaned everything and put the whole thing back together and then did another finishing cut right across the bar. Before I did that, I tightened this front clamp and there's a keep plate under here that grips under the front of the bed there. And it just holds this saddle tight down on this V-way. And I didn't have to turn it very much. And now the saddle's really quite tight, but it made certain that the saddle was pulled right down onto that V. And also this time, I did lock the cross slide. There's an Allen screw under this side and I got it all locked and clamped up. And I got some improvements. I'll show you the results. Now, if this feels like Groundhog Day, stay with it for a minute. So this time, 28.32, And then looking at the variation in millimeters here, 0 0.035, 35, 3, 4, and 7. And then looking at that in thou, minus 1.4, 1.4, 1.2, 1.6, 2 1.8. All these are minuses, of course. So what we're seeing, I think, is a bit of the bed here, which is not worn because the saddle doesn't normally go up there. Then we get onto a worn part, and the results are reasonably consistent then until we get close on towards the chuck, but just before the gap block. I think I'd be fairly happy with that. I can understand it, I can explain it. But then I did a test, which again, didn't make any sense at all. I'll quickly show you that. Okay, so I've set the dial gauge up where the indicator point aligns exactly where the tool would have been 
which means that the saddle is in exactly the same place as where the tool started to cut. And because this bar has been machined in exactly these settings just now, I should be reading zero all the way along this bar with this gauge. And of course it doesn't. It starts on zero. I don't know how much of this you can make out. The gauge has to be tilted this way so that the measurement point is where the tool point was. And as I move along, hopefully you can see that moving off. Now, tell me this. <laughs> if I've just machined that with exactly this setup, how can that be moving off? I checked the tool. There wasn't, you know, excessive wear on the end of the tool. It wasn't being worn away as it was going along. Uh, and in fact, actually, looking at this, this is a negative. So that gap is closing. This saddle is moving this way. Now I'll show you something else. I thought maybe when I started the lathe and set this saddle in motion, something about this gearing was throwing the saddle in. So in other words, the dynamic, dynamics of it were different from being static like this. So let's just start that up and I'll show you. So you saw the saddle power feed engaged there, didn't change the geometry whatsoever. Just one further thought, obviously the tool would have been pressing against the bar when it was cutting. There's no pressure there, so let me see if there's any play. No. So you can see this is, defies science. If you know the answer, Please tell me. Another dawn, another day, and I'm still trying to reconcile between the measured values on the bar using the micrometer and what I'm reading on the tool post for the dial gauge. I've switched over to an imperial dial gauge because my brain is really an imperial brain. And also, neither of my dial gauges are that good. They do stick occasionally. So I thought an alternative view with another gauge would be a good idea. Everything's cold today. Uh, it's five degrees outside. That's uh, 41 if you prefer. And I am getting some consistent measurements. Anyway, <laughs> the conclusion at this moment in time, check your watch, could be that there's a little bit of taper as this turns, meaning this would need adjusting. But what I'm going to do is another cut and just verify that as I've not done a cut today. I've just a few more things to try. I've put this car jack under the back side of the saddle, put pressure on it and see if I can get it to lift. But I can't. I'd adjusted it anyway before all of this um, and I was pretty confident it was okay but I just wanted to prove it. And I'm trying the same thing at this side. I've put the car jack under the apron here and uh, wound it up tight. Makes no difference to the clock. No difference worth mentioning. Right, I've got a new tip in the tool. Just for the sake of entertainment, I'm going to turn towards the tailstock. 480 RPM, 4th out per rev, 8th out cut. far trying to turn towards the tailstock you heard that chattering so I brought the tool back to this end got a beautiful finish though right time to do some measuring okay this is the final measurement for the final test finally ever because I don't know about you I've had enough of this really right 28.02 28.02 28.02 28.02 28.02 28.02 
28, dead. Yeah, 28.02. So it's now narrow at that end, barreled slightly in the middle, and narrower here. That's 28.01 millimetres, obviously. I don't have a 1 to 2 Imperial mic. Yeah, that's definitely about 4 thou narrower there than it is along here, give or take, you know. Yep. So, if you remember the previous tests, it was wider here and narrow at this end. Now we seem to be reversed. The answer is I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, and I still don't know. Let me put this in. Right then. Clamp, clamp, clamp. Okay, get that about right. Let's go to here. Actually, you know, that's not bad at all. Zero that. Well, look at that. Let me share that with you. I'm at the tailstock end, and yesterday, the bar was fatter at this end and thinner at the headstock end. And today, it's thinner at this end and fatter at the headstock end. Now with that in mind, let's clock it. Now the result here is that the gauge has moved in towards the work by one thou, even though the bar is fatter at this end, and it's fatter by 1.6 thou altogether. So really nothing corresponds between the static situation and the dynamic situation. I can't tell you why, whether it's the action of the two, bit of movement in the saddle, but if it is movement in the saddle, it's very, very marginal, I think. Although it could be where. Can't really scientifically explain this. I'm going to do one more cut and that absolutely will be the end of this. If I carry on like this, it'll end up as a bicycle wheel spindle. Let's get it measured. If I put the results of run 3 next to run 4, and I look at the differences in each of these steps, which are about 2 inches apart, 50 mil if you prefer, and allowing for a little bit of inaccuracy in my micrometer work, you can see that they follow much the same pattern. So two hundredths of a millimeter, five hundredths of a millimeter, six, six, five, three, and here we've got one hundredth of a millimeter. So that's probably just my measuring error almost between there and there. It's only one hundredth of a millimeter. So five compares to four, six compares to five, 6 compares to 6, 5 compares to 5, and if you're not completely dizzy by now, 3 compares to 4. So it's a reasonable, and that's hundreds of a millimetre I was pointing out there. It's reasonably consistent and repeatable, and that's the first time I've managed to do that. But the difference is today, the bar, this machine bar, is narrower towards the tailstock. Whereas yesterday it was narrower towards the headstock. Really can't explain why. So let's try and pull out some conclusions from all this. How do you produce a conclusion to something like this? Well, the first conclusion I've drawn is 
Don't try and make a video on turning a barrel off barrel of your lathe. It's gone on for days. To be slightly more serious, I'm, first conclusion, I'm exceptionally pleased with the quality of this finish. And I think it sets my mind at rest about any problems with the bearings. If you watch my other video, you know I thought the bearings were a bit too tight and I backed them off slightly. So, would I get chatter? No. Really pleased with that. There is, conclusion number two, there is a, a big difference between a static test and a turning test. So, the stat, so for this lathe anyway, the static test is a reasonable indication. If you are miles off, then it, you could set it up with a static test. But for the fine tuning of what happens in the real world, you'd have to do an actual turning test. You saw that I got inconsistent results on one day, you know, with run one and run two versus three and four. And I found that the only thing that made a difference to the result was just, sli just tightening up this front clamp here. There's clearly some element of misalignment, clearly, <laughs> I think clearly, some element of misalignment to some degree in the tailstock, but I can't tell you exactly how much. And there's certainly some effects of bed wear, without a doubt, because I see I still get this little bit of barreling in the middle of what I'm turning here. If you ask me to turn a parallel bar as things are, I can probably do it to within two thou over a one foot length, which isn't really a bad result for an old lathe like this. Um, but beyond that, it's down to the weather. <laughs> so I hope that was useful to you. Thank you for watching. Hacks be shared.